people who are live. So welcome everyone. And just to let folks know, yeah, Rob Beam, excited hello from Seattle. People can follow Rob's lead, introduce yourself in the chat. What are you excited about for today? And for those of you who are on on time, we are going to get started and dive in. It's not too late to invite people. And guess what? Not only is this happening on Zoom, this is happening on live stream. So people can go to movement.vote Facebook. And, and I actually want to encourage all of you, you're going to be hearing from some great organizers today. Go be organizers yourselves. Think of a person or two who you can invite, who you can text to join and they can they don't even need to get on zoom they can just go to movement.votes live stream and this is good this is also going to be live streamed simultaneously um, by occupy democrats and humanity for progress which have two huge facebook followings that are doing this simultaneously with us um, for anyone who wants closed captioning um, you can just go down to that little cc button and you can, um, yeah, get closed captioning. Yay. Um, use video for better experience if you're on the phone. Um, there are a lot of awesome slides. And yes, this briefing will be recorded and shared, but there's nothing like the live version. Um, and like I was saying, it's not too late to invite people. And big shout outs to our partners um, who are live streaming with us. I, all you Occupy Dems and Humanity for Progress people, we see you, we love you. And this is this is happening. And really want to encourage people to use the chat for comments and to share for Q&A. Instead of waiting till the end to have Q&A, we have a bunch of people on our team who are in the chat right now. Um, so you can ask questions as you go. And we're going to do an hour of Q&A throughout the whole time. So just really want to thank everyone for being here with this MVP community that we're building. We accomplished so much together and it's so great to have you here with us tonight. So what are we doing? Building a progressive decade. Who knows about that? Who was on that call in March when we launched the progressive decade campaign? Cause yeah, we have a lot of short-term things we have to do but we have a long-term vision to build a progressive decade to make the 2020s, a progressive decade. And we, have, we even have a chant that goes along with that. I say progressive, you say decade, progressive decade, progressive decade. Yeah, we are gonna make the 2020s a progressive decade. That is what we are doing. And it is a big inspiring goal that we are putting our whole selves into making this happen. So, and for those of you who are on the call in March, I don't know if you follow the news, we had some incredible organizations from Pittsburgh who reported this was just a few weeks before their big election in Pittsburgh that happened in April. And guess what? They were trying to elect some judges, they had some ballot measures, and there was a long shot that they wanted to try to elect the first black mayor of Pittsburgh. And that was a long shot, but guess what? They won all of it. They won four judges, they won two ballot measures and they elected the first black mayor, mayor elect of Pittsburgh. And we are here to witness it. All this work that all they all put in that we supported, they won, they delivered. And that is building toward a progressive Pennsylvania that we're gonna need in 2022. So um, going into the agenda for tonight, <coughs> it's gonna be myself and Mirna Orozco, our incredible director of grant making and philanthropic strategy, co-emceeing tonight. Um, and basically first, you're gonna hear a little bit from us, a little bit of context and a few numbers we're gonna share. Um, then you're gonna hear from incredible leader of the Arizona State House or the, the, lead, the Democratic leader. He's just a vote short of, of, well, actually two votes from actually being the majority leader um, as well as running one of our local organizations. And you know people are always like, 
Oh, Stacey Abrams. If only there was a Stacey Abrams in every state. Well, Reginald Bolding kind of has a similar thing going on um, of, of both being a leader in, in the Democratic Party, in the legislature, and running a huge organization, which you'll hear more about. Arizona and West Virginia. Why are we talking about West Virginia? It hasn't been one of our tier one states. I think you know why we're talking about West Virginia and Arizona together. It's because everything is on the table. Everything is at stake with our federal legislation right now that's gonna de determine so much of what happens in 2022. And a lot of it's gonna come down to mansion and cinema, right? So we wanna hear from organizations in those states who are not only working on all the local things they have to work on, all the state things they have to work on, but are also helping get our senator, get their senators to yes on this absolutely critical federal legislation. So you all are in for a real treat to hear from Democratic leader Reginald Bolding and also Renee Haggerty, who is an incredible organizer dot connector in West Virginia. Um, so you all are in for a real treat. And then we're gonna give you a peek under the hood at MVP's capacity building program. And you probably think, what, what is that? MVP gives away money to groups and we you know, help you all move money. Our capacity building is the amazing behind the scenes thing that we do in addition to moving money. And, and our incredible JPP is gonna, gonna give you an inside look at what where the groups are at this year and how we're helping them get to the next level. And then you're gonna hear from our incredible Jane Lerner, uh, donor organizer extraordinaire, who's gonna talk about how you can help and get involved. So um, going on to the next, you know, just wanna ground us, you know, we have a whole bunch of slides we could show you, just gonna show two slides. One is just a reminder of all that we've done together. This is when you look at these, this slide, this incredible numbers, you know, together we have done this. You know, we went from a Republican trifecta, the bottom of the pit of hopelessness four years ago, and now we have, by, by the skin of our teeth, a Democratic trifecta. We all together helped all these incredible groups do that, and we're just getting started in building this progressive decade. So thank you so much. I'm going to pass it to my co-host, Mirna Orozco, um, to talk about where we are now and introduce the first speaker. Hi, everyone. Um, so good to be here with you all again. Um, I am really stoked to have all of these incredible people on the call with us today um, and to get to share with you all a little bit about where we are. Um, and my job is to give you an update on where we are in our grant making since our last meeting. Um, during that briefing, we announced that our goal was to move $30 million this year to organizations on the ground. Um, even though we knew, know that the need is much greater than that, we said, you know, at MVP, we believe that this is the contribution we can make with all of your support um, to movement partners on the ground, trying to get early investments out the door as much as possible as organizations gear up to train, build, um, and do much more in preparation for 22 and beyond. Um, so this that you're looking at right now is a breakdown of where our money has gone so far um, state by state. Um, I'm happy to report um, that this is a little outdated. So it says that we have moved over $10 million and that's actually over $11 million now, almost 12 million with three additional million dollars going out in this next month, um, which means that we're basically halfway to our goal um, at the end of this upcoming month of moving 50 $15 million to movement organizations on the ground, which is really, 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 really exciting. Um, for me, every time somebody throws out a big number of millions of dollars, I'm always like, ah, are we going to do that? But our incredible team and you all have made that happen for so many partners on the ground. Um, and it's really exciting. So I want to take some time to appreciate all of you, um, to say thank you, because it is because of you that this is able to happen. Um, and early investments are able to go 
out to these organizations on the ground. Um, and they've been critical for our movement partners to be able to continue the work from last year um, and ensuring that they're continuing to build um, and prepare. So um, you'll get to hear a little bit more about what those funds have done throughout this call. Um, but uh, uh, without further ado, I'm going to also introduce our next speaker, um, who Billy kind of stole my thunder in um, introducing, uh, no joke, because I get to talk about um, introducing Reginald Bolding, um, who is the executive director of Our Voice, Our Vote in Arizona, um, where he leads massive voter registration efforts along with an incredible um, team of people, young people fighting for change in the state. Um, um, not only does he do that, but he's also the Arizona House Democratic leader. And if that was not enough, he's also announced his candidacy to be the next Secretary of State in Arizona. So that's really exciting. Um, I do want to note that when we made the invitation, um, Reginald had not announced yet. Um, at MVP, we don't endorse candidates, but we're really excited that in Arizona and in states across the country, people are running movement candidates and are winning. And so we're super stoked for the opportunity that Arizonans have um, and many others have across the country to be able to run these candidates that come from organizations that are building people power um, on the ground. So um, Reginald's going to tell us about what the state of Arizona is looking like right now. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is uh, an exciting day for, for a number of reasons. Right now here in Arizona, uh, we're actually celebrating what we call signy die or end of legislative session actually today about a few minutes ago we just finished our session so all of the legislation that i'll be talking about shortly we know that's where it will at least stop right there we don't have any more um, uh, pieces of legislation that could be problematic from this point on for the rest of this year but uh to back up first i want to tell you a little bit about myself um i started in this movement in an unconventional way uh, as a special education teacher. That's what got me in this work, uh, teaching middle school math and, 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 and English, um, and really just seeing the educational inequity that was taking place with my kids. Uh, quite frankly, in the, the district that I taught, many of my students would walk to school in the streets because there were no sidewalks, or they seen a revolving door of substitute teachers, or literally we didn't have enough textbooks so all of our students could take home their textbooks in order to do their homework. So I would find myself Xerox copying pages for our kids uh, for homework. And just this idea of educational inequity and the belief that your zip code should not determine your educational outcomes really drove me to start to think about the system beyond the four walls of my classroom. Because the reality is, is there were policymakers who were making strategic decisions about education that had never been in the classroom for 30, 40, or 50 years. And I just didn't feel like that was a right. So that really pushed me into to the movement. And, and around that time here in Arizona, um, you know, around this time in 2010, uh, there was a lot happening in Arizona. Uh, Republicans actually controlled uh, the state legislature with super majorities. Every single statewide seat was Republican held. Uh, we had bills. Uh, like SB 1070, SB 1070, which is known as the show me your papers law, uh, a sheriff that uh, literally had uh, uh, individuals who were incarcerated living uh, and housed in tents outside in the Arizona uh, heat. Um, we were a place that people would literally say, you can't spell crazy without AZ. That was the that was the tag, and and people would you know often shy away from saying they're from Arizona, um, but one of the things that happened uh, is is the movement. The movement stepped up, and the movement grew, and we moved from just registering people to vote to being more sophisticated, and and now turning out these people to vote, and being even more sophisticated to running program during legislative session to expand those opportunities, and we have been largely successful. Uh, in 2018 and 2020 here in Arizona, we've seen the greatest turnout uh, Arizona has, has seen in years, record number turnout. And that was because we registered people to vote, we got them signed up for our early uh, voting list, 
which is the, the mail-in ballot. And we talked about the issues that mattered most to people. It was beyond candidates. It was about issues that could transform lives for people. And because of that, Arizona has diametrically changed where we're at. We have a, a legislature now that is literally the closest that it's been since the 1960s. The House of Representatives has a total of 60 members. There are 31 Republicans and 29 Democrats. In the Senate, there are 30 members. There are 16 Republicans and 14 Democrats. These were super majorities literally 10 years ago, but now there is literally a one vote difference in each chamber that goes to either stopping legislation or two votes away from passing some progressive legislation that could really change the dynamic of Arizona. And at the top of the, at the top of the ticket, we now have two Democratic senators. And we'll talk a little bit about one of those Democratic senators uh, uh, today shortly. So the movement and organizing has been has been extremely important. And what we even seen in 2020 is that the election was so uh, profound in turnout that we even have a ridiculous audit that's taken place and actually moving across the country as we speak right now, um, trying to somehow invalidate uh, results of what we know was a free, fair and secure election. So at the legislature, um, there has been a little bit of good, bad and ugly. Uh, and, and to talk to you a little bit about what those fights have been, um, the good thing is that uh, we have a voting rights coalition, and that is a group of several organizations like Our Voice, Our Vote, the group that I happen to lead, and others um, who are coordinating day by day, week by week on how we can fight back against some of the most aggressive voter suppression legislation that Arizona has ever seen. We actually had bills that would make it so every single person would have to take their photo ID, Xerox copy that photo, photo ID, put it inside of a mail-in envelope with their ballot and then send that uh, to, the, to our recorder's office for it to actually count. We saw bills that would also make every single voter have to get their ballots notarized. And in both of those forms, we say, uh, would result into a, a, a poll tax. So when we talk about the new Jim Crow or new age Jim Crow, we absolutely saw that here in Arizona with poll taxes and legislation. But because of that voting rights coalition, being sophisticated and using paid media, social media, direct action, even hiring lobbyists, we were able to stop that bill collectively as a group uh, and make sure that Senate Bill 1713 is no longer in place so people will have the ability to vote without those forms of poll taxes. So we also seen some things that were pretty bad. Here in Arizona, um, uh, we were really first in the nation to really start mail-in ballot. 80% of Arizonans vote by mail. So in large part, the election tends to be over um, uh, or is very, very close to being over before election day. And for candidates with me throwing on my other hat, you know, that means that you have 30 days of election day. Um, and at one point in time, uh, Republicans, they always uh, would lead with the mail-in ballots. You know, that was something that they, they trained their uh, electorate to do, is to write in your ballot and mail it in. But what we found was that our communities, they are looking for easy, accessible ways to vote that allows them to still participate um, and we started to use mail-in ballots as a strategy, our permanent early voting list. And we have been able to uh, register and sign people up for our permanent early voting list. And now Democrats are now more likely to vote by mail than any other party. And that has totally changed the dynamics of our elections here in Arizona. And that's how we've seen record number of turnout in 2018 and 2020. And because uh, we have been so successful, there was a pretty bad bill at the legislature, Senate Bill 1485, which would remove 200,000 Arizonans from the permanent early voting list. 200,000 Arizonans would be purged from being able to vote by mail, primarily because we've been able to use the system to really change the dynamics of Arizona. Um, and that bill was so aggressive that it directly was targeting um, uh, voters of color, uh, voters in uh, rural uh, Arizona, our native voters, elderly voters, uh, primarily um, through uh, several different tactics. 
uh, that our Republican-led legislature, the closest Republican-led legislature that we've ever had again, um, uh, using those tactics in order to push those pieces of legislation. And, and that was recently signed in law by the governor uh, here in Arizona. So we know that in 2022, we'll continue to roll up our sleeves to make sure that um, anyone who could have been affected by these permanent early voting lists, we keep them directly on um, uh, mail-in ballots and we allow them to stay into participation. The good thing though, is that we were able to use our voice as a voting rights coalition to actually delay the effect of that law uh, and, and of the removal of 200,000 people uh, till, till 2024. That's when it will actually kick in. And that was Senate Bill 1485. And then we have a little bit of what we call uh, the ugly here in Arizona. So a little bit of good, bad, and ugly. So what we have seen here uh, at our legislature has been retaliation, um, retaliation on, on elected officials, retaliation on democracy, and that has really have not provided an opportunity um, uh, for uh, us as a, as a state to really continue to gain that prominence that we so welcomed and earned during the 2020 election as a swing state that actually went blue. Um, we just recently passed a budget that currently attacks the Secretary of State office. So currently now, uh, and this budget was literally just signed in law by the governor today, um, now our, uh, our Secretary of State's office no longer has the ability to defend itself in court with election cases. That is now given to the Attorney General. And add a little bit of context, our current Secretary of State office is held by a, a Democrat and our Attorney General's office is held by a Republican. So the legislature has put forth legislation that will no longer allow the Secretary of State's office to defend any elections lawsuits. Moreover, what it would also do is no longer allow the Secretary of State's office to make hiring decisions when it comes to attorneys. Um, and that has also been taken away as well. Um, and we have consistently seen uh, a number of these uh, different uh, mechanisms and the worst part is uh, because of the audit that's taking place in Arizona, and we don't even really call it an audit here, we call it a fraud it because we know it's fake. We know that it actually will prove nothing and it will not change any of the election results in 2020. Um, the equipment that was given to uh, um, a firm called the Cyber Ninjas, and I'm, yeah, literally the Cyber Ninjas is this firm that's conducting the audit. Um, the equipment has not been secure. Uh, the equipment has not been used as a normal audits have been conducted. So now all of the equipment that has been given to this firm and the ballots that they received um, has, have essentially been compromised. And we don't know who had access to the ballots. And we also don't know what type of things that they were doing with our election equipment. So now in the state of Arizona has to buy, the, the state of Arizona and Maricopa County now has to buy entirely new elections equipment for the next election cycle. So $6 million of election equipment can no longer be used. The US Department of Homeland Security uh, said that um, they do not believe that that e equipment is secure and they have recommended to the Secretary of State's office and all of our election officials to no longer use the equipment. And of course, at the state legislature, we have not given the funds to actually buy new election equipment. So that will be that'll be the next fight. The, the last piece I'll hit on is just um, our senator, um, uh, Kirsten Cinema, our senior senator. We know um, voting rights uh, is an issue that is not just unique to Arizona. Uh, this is there is voting rights issues and fights for democracy across this country. And we can't play this game of whack-a-mole and trying to have coalitions across state by state to fight against these voter suppression uh, pieces of legislation. There has to be a federal solution. And we have to pass things like the For the People Act in order to get us to a position to do that. But we also know the only way we do that is to have a real conversation about the filibuster, what it currently is doing now and what it has done in the past and what it may mean in the future. So with that being said, um, at Our Voice, Our Vote Arizona, uh, we've been using what we call a carrot and stick model with our senior senator to let her know that uh, when she is showing up for our community, we're gonna show up for her. 
Uh, and when she's not showing up for our community, we're going to make sure that she understands that. So um, we are celebrating uh, when uh, Sen Senator Cinema does things well, uh, in particular, signing, uh, you know, voting for the American Rescue Plan. Um, you know, uh, our President Biden often talked about uh, ensuring that you have a, a shot in an arm and a check in your pocket. And what we did at Our Voice, Our Vote is we took out a full page ad in all of the major newspapers here um, to thank our Senator, uh, thank Senator Cinema, and also thank Senator Mark Kelly. Additionally, at vaccine locations, we had a, uh, a airplane literally that flew over the vaccine sites, uh, thanking our Senator for the, the Senators for the work that they did to make sure that uh, we're fighting COVID as best we can here in Arizona and, and people are receiving the resources that they need. Um, but we're also um, making sure that when it comes to things like For the People Act and other issues that we need our Senator to stand up for that, that she understands that we are, that, that we're here in the fight. Um, so we have organized text messaging campaigns. We have done direct actions um, at our Senator's office. Uh, recently partnered with some organizations here and additionally, additionally some in the South. Uh, our, our group went on a freedom ride in which they moved from uh, Phoenix. They drove a bus, four buses from Phoenix to Washington, D.C., stopping at civil rights locations along the line, along the way, Tulsa, Birmingham, um, uh, Memphis, uh, Tennessee, um, and other locations to really um, talk about the filibuster and the For the People Act as a civil rights issue, as we know, that's what this issue is, is about. It's about our civil rights as a country and standing up and protecting uh, democracy. Um, and, and we have continued to move forward and we'll continue to do that. And in 2022, we know that we have another major race, um, several major races here, uh, and we wanna make sure that Arizona stays blue we continue to make sure that uh, the United States Senate uh, keeps uh, the slim majority that it has. And if we have the ability to grow up, we'll continue to do that. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are electing candidates up and down the ballot uh, that's gonna fight for democracy because we know that's what this time stands for. And that only can happen with uh, you know, people like you who continue to fight with us and roll up our sleeves to advocate uh, for democracy. So at, at Our Voice, Our Vote Arizona, we are excited about the work. We're excited to continue to work in partnership and we're ready to do this with MVP. Thank you, Leader Balding. I, I think I think we're all giving you like a round of, of uh, a standing ovation right now and and your, your leadership on all levels and, and OVOV and, and all the organizations in Arizona. Part of what we love is there's, you're so collaborative with each other. You're all you know doing it together and, and you were very, very humble. Um, as someone who's running for Secretary of State, you didn't even talk about your own campaign, and it's not our lane to talk about it. But you know, obviously, lots of people on the phone also give to candidates. You know, um, and you know, and I'll just say in general that um, giving to down ballot exciting candidates of color, especially um, early, is the most strategic way to give to candidates if you are doing that. Um, and but it's not our lane to talk about that um, in in the specific, but um, we, we just are so um, so so proud of all of your work um, and and thrilled to be here with you. And with that, I'm gonna thank you and pivot to West Virginia. Arizona and West Virginia are are, are twins. And I'm gonna tell you a quick story. Um, um, which is one of the things that I'm most proud of that we've done this year, uh, almost as soon as we got the incredible results out of Georgia, I made a call um, to a guy named Will Carter in West Virginia. And, and Will's a really extraordinary mensch of a person who's, who's uh, on the line uh, with us right now. And, and I said, Will, you know, and he built the donor table from scratch and that there was just not a lot of, of infrastructure of any kind there. And, you know, um, and I called him and I said, Will, you know, I'm sure everyone's calling you right now, throwing millions of dollars at you. What's the strategy on, on moving mansion? And he said, we're not getting a lot of calls, certainly not millions of dollars. And um, I hate to tell you this, but there's literally no one in the state of West Virginia whose job it is 
to move Manchin on federal policy. Everyone's working in survival mode. Everyone's been underinvested in for so many years, you know, just working, working on local. And he was like, you know, it would really help if, if uh, you guys could send some seed funding for us to at least hire a person to, to work on the federal work with Manchin. And um, so we, we gave some seed money and, and they not only hired a person, they unleashed a, a catalytic, uh, now there are 40 organizations, there's a whole team of people, there's an incredible effort that's gone from zero to 60 in just a few months. And you're gonna hear from Renee Haggerty, who is, is uh, been just like coordinating and helping build with all these groups, this incredible effort. Um, it's, it's so great to have you on here. Renee, and uh, just wanna, wanna pass the mic to you and just say on behalf of all of us that, you know, the future of our country is, is so much, you know, in the hands of, of you and all your, your team in West Virginia and just grateful to have you here tonight with us. Well, thank you, Billy. Uh, hello everyone, both here with me in the Zoom and I understand live out there across the country. As Billy said, my name is Renee Haggerty. My pronouns are she, her. I am a first generation American who was raised Republican in a Rust Belt town back when the Rust Belt used to be blue. It took me about 10 years to transition from the youngest member of my county party to the progressive that I am today. And that would not have happened without a lot of investment from community and issue advocacy groups. And you'll notice that's about the same time frame and investment structure that's needed for a state to evolve from one progressive ideology to conservative or vice versa. West Virginia is my chosen home state because it shares my core values of community with a healthy dose of rebellious progressive hope. I experienced the rise of the Tea Party from the inside, and I can tell you without a doubt, there is the start of such activity on the left inside West Virginia today. Um, Alex, I don't know if we can do slides, but if we can, I've got some visuals for some folks. Um, how do I know that there's hope inside of West Virginia? I know because at For West Virginia's Future, we pay a lot of attention to the ecosystem. We know that in any ecosystem, you need different types of organisms to be healthy. And just like an ecosystem, our political ecosystem needs a lot of organizations to be healthy. So you can see on this chart to the left, we've got civic engagement. Those are our voter registration groups and our issue advocates who are doing local work. And then on the right hand side, we've got elections, partisan work on the IE side, up and down, you've got state, local, national capacity. And in between, you've got coordination. We need healthy and thriving C3 nonpartisan activity in order to have effective electoral campaigns. And both of those need issue advocacy at the state, local, and federal level. They also need to be coordinated as much as legally permissible, which is what For West Virginia's Future does day to day. At the start of 21, we were preparing to launch initial C3 and C4 infrastructure. Um, and that means that those did not exist prior to 2021. Um, but as you all know, and as Billy mentioned, on January 6th, we knew it wouldn't be enough to have just C3 and C4 infrastructure. We needed to build out the federal infrastructure that could cover both of those. And so thanks to an initial investment from MVP and others, we were able to scale up coordination to have excuse me, to handle federal accountability. Next slide. And why was federal accountability so important? Because of this guy. Um, <laughs> this particular center, Senator, who needs no introduction. Um, West Virginians know better than anyone how frustrating it can be to try to work with him, but we also have evidence of it being possible. Our goal from the beginning of this year has been threefold. We wanna make sure that Manchin is hearing from West Virginians, including Republicans, everywhere and in every way about how popular these policies are and how needed. We know that the framing of broad public support has been effective at overriding bipartisanship, for example, most recently in the American Recovery Act fight. 
number two, we wanted to make sure that we were playing to Manchin's desire to deliver for West Virginia with language about other heroes that he admires and his opportunity to join them. Third, we knew we wanted to emphasize the language of urgency rather than the filibuster or any other uh, procedural point specifically, because we know that Manchin has struggles with those, but also because of what our opposition is up to. If you can go to the next slide. Our opposition started running large scale TV, digital and radio as early as February with particularly heavy saturation in March with ads like this one. I do wanna give you a trigger warning. This ad is relatively violent. If you are squeamish or have children in the room, you might wanna have them turn away for about 30 seconds. Alex, you're good to play whenever you're ready. The new left, unleashed and unhinged. A pack of rabid dogs sicked on anyone who isn't woke, whatever that means. No one is safe. They've canceled everyone from Dr. Seuss to Abraham Lincoln. Now they're coming for Senator Joe Manchin. Manchin has stood up to the new left, refusing their demands to cancel the filibuster, standing up for West Virginia values. Tell Manchin, keep fighting. Don't cancel the filibuster. Ooh, yeah. Um, go ahead, take a deep breath. That's quite a lot to watch. Um, it's also quite a lot to live saturated with. Um, but our opposition is not a one trick pony. I want to make this clear. They know that for some folks, they don't need to go this extreme to be effective. A simple protect our freedom message will do just fine. And both of these types of ads have been running all over our internet space, our public newspapers, everywhere you can imagine for months now. In June, our opposition pivoted to a grassroots strategy um, that allowed them to elevate email and text partners to call into Manchin's office. Now, while that was a bit of a respite, we know that indications are pointing to July being a blanket coverage anti-S1 uh, month, which is why our teams did not wait to get started in building out the structure needed to combat this. So as you can see, we began preparing the infrastructure to coordinate and execute this work inside the state as early as possible. This is a broad overlay of the working groups that are operating inside of the state currently. They've mostly organized themselves with coordination support from FWVF and we're thrilled with how productive those have been. If you can go to the next slide, our partners include tiny volunteer only groups like the Summers County Huddle, which emerged from the Indivisible Movement, as well as large national powerhouses like End Citizens United. All of these groups, regardless of size, are working together on messaging, tactics, and strategy to maximize our collective effectiveness. Next slide. Those strategies are primarily constituency based. For example, our county clerks have been misinformed by our Secretary of State, a la Stop the Steal, since very early in the year. We have made efforts to reach them with their friends, their neighbors, and other professionals to ensure that what was once a unanimous opposition among county clerks to S1 is no longer unanimous as of May. In addition, La recently, more than 100 business owners inside the state of West Virginia signed a public letter to Manchin asking him to support S1. And just last week, civic leaders dropped off nearly 400 birthday cards and a cake to Manchin's office for West Virginia's birthday to say, just like the year West Virginia was born, inaction is not an option. We need S1 statehood and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. If you go to the next slide, these are just anecdotes of strategies that are happening all across the state. Digital, text, email, events, and more. We are leaving no county untouched and no voter uncontacted. Next slide. What has that meant? Well, just since May, I can now officially report that as of July 4th, we are on track to have called the entire voter file of landlines and cell phones and are on track to have called the progressive part of that file about three times. We'll be expanding through July to call everyone multiple times. And yes, that includes staunch conservatives who we are also seeing very positive patch through rates with. 
So hundreds of calls, thousands of voter contacts, but that's not all. Our events are what I'm particularly proud of. As you can see from this picture, uh, thank you, Alex. <laughs> We are, in, we are meeting West Virginians where they are in very creative ways. This picture is from a Juneteenth event. Um, and you can see the For the People banner in the background of this public and family art effort. Um, so we are making sure that the, the language of For the People, the importance of it, is everywhere across our state. On the next slide, you'll see evidence of marches, music concerts, earned media events, and so much more as much as possible reaching folks with these evergreen types of materials so that whether they meet us in May or July, the fight and the language are the same and their opportunity to get involved is clear. Our field efforts are also generating enthusiastic support from conservatives, as long as they haven't heard too much about us from Fox News yet. What you can see here is that the policies are popular because they impact our future in a way that everyone can appreciate. On the left, I just wanna point out, make sure everyone can see in case your screen is a little small. Yes, that is a MAGA hat with support for the People Act. So across the board, Americans want these policies when we're talking about the democracy piece, very clearly in West Virginia, those trends hold. We consider the work done up to this point to have been foundational, laying the groundwork for what the work that matters, excuse me, laying the groundwork for what is to come. The important part is what we do with this foundation. This is what it will take to ensure that staffing levels remain, that the work expands into other issue areas and remains well-coordinated. We've raised the operational budget for FWBF. So all of these targeted funds will go directly to partner organizations on the ground. Thank you so much for being a great audience and for being early supporters. If you wanna start on the next 10 years of work in West Virginia, please reach out to our donor leader, Will Carter, whose information is on the slide and who has been participating uh, by answering your questions in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Renee. Wow, like huge standing ovation. I'm just gonna say something really quickly before passing it to Mirna. Just to put this in perspective, okay, three million. Wow, that sounds like a lot of money. Quick quiz: How many millions are in a trillion? You can put it in the chat. What's your answer? How many millions are in a trillion? So we're talking about just the infrastructure alone. Do we get a one trillion dollar infrastructure package, or do we get a four trillion dollar infrastructure package? That's right. Uh, yeah, the answer is a million. There are a million millions in a trillion, okay? Our brains are not set up to comprehend how big a trillion dollars is. So, so us collectively moving $3 million, if we could move $3 million and get a $4 trillion infrastructure package instead of a $1 trillion, that's like us giving Renee $3 and her giving us back three million dollars. That is the leverage that we're talking about here. That is why we have to generate as much energy as we can to support the work in West Virginia, Arizona, and these battleground states. So I just want to give put these numbers in context. And a similar amount, by the way, is needed in Arizona. Um, and, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Mirna and say thank you so much, Renee and Reggie. And you know, it is our job to do everything we can to support you and all the groups across the country who are fighting the good fight um, and, and organize money to support you. And with that, I will pass it back to Mirna. Thanks so much, um, uh, Billy and Renee and Reggie, um, for all of the work that everyone is doing across the country. I am really pumped and I hope that you all are too. 
three dollars on three million worth of an investment is a really smart choice any financial planner can tell you that so um really excited for that return um but also just for the work that y'all are doing uh in the state um and for that progressive hope um that you mentioned which is really exciting um so all of this amazing work that folks are doing in arizona and west virginia and many others around the country um is critical to helping us defend our wins um, fight back against all the bad things that you all heard about um, and more that's coming our way um, and to continue building for tomorrow. Uh, this year is essential for us in helping support organizations to get not only the early investments, but to really be able to dig deep um, with them to get them other support that, you know, sometimes might not just be covered by um, a grant here and there, but goes beyond um, what that can do. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about um, what JP is P is going to be talking about today, which is MVP's capacity building program um, called Movement Match. And it's part of what I like to say um, is the magic sauce or the secret sauce that MVP because it really does do that. It goes beyond um, just moving money to digging deep with our movement partners and supporting them in a holistic way um, from access to tech tools to healing justice um, and everything in between. Between. Um, so I get to introduce you all to the amazing uh, JP Peretta, who is our deputy director of our capacity building program, um, so that they can give you insight on how that magic sauce is made at MVP. So passing it over to you, JPP. Thank you for the warm welcome, Mizna. Um, and thank you, Reginald and Rene. It's always such a joy to hear from groups and organizers on the ground doing such impactful work. It's our goal as a team to invest early on and help ensure the best possible outcomes for these campaigns and ongoing work. I'm thrilled at the opportunity to join y'all tonight to talk a little bit about the capacity building program, our team, our work, aka the secret sauce, our approach and the impact of what we do. My name is JPP and my pronouns are they and them. I'm the deputy director of the program. I'm joined on the capacity building team by the director, Eugenia Smith, and two part-time team members, Tony, who handles the bank of resource providers we work with, and Sid, who leads our healing justice work. Collectively, we have a wealth of organizing experience, ranging from on the ground grassroots work, to leading organizations, to working directly on campaigns. Personally, I owe the legacy of my organizing work to the queer, trans, black, indigenous and people of color leaders that are so often the unsung heroes in our struggle for liberation. My connection to this work as a non-binary Latinx immigrant informs my deep passion for helping resource and sustain movements. Despite my experience in voter engagement work and living in this country since I was two years old, I actually didn't become a US citizen until early 2016. The 2016 elections were actually the first time I was eligible and able to vote a right that I had to wait until I was in my, well into my thirties to receive. So I know what it feels like to feel disenfranchised and to see how without the resources and tools for our communities to thrive, folks are left out of that conversation. We designed a capacity building program knowing that our groups are the experts in mobilizing their own communities. For us, capacity building is defined as providing the support and resources to our grantee partners that are directly outlined by the groups themselves and are vital to sustainable campaigns and movement building. We listen to them and make space for their feedback through surveys and talking to the state advisor team who are on the ground with them. We collaborate with groups and aid them in making plans to match the right service to the need. We often even go as far as providing hands-on support, like helping a group establish baseline goals that are driven by their values, that are realistic and impactful, or listening to a group's growing edges and helping them troubleshoot while giving suggestions for potential services that can help support the implementation of their long-term strategies. To meet our grantee partners' needs effectively, MVP has a four-part multi-prong approach. We offer tech tools such as the voter file so they can find those voters that have been left out or behind. We offer trainings that are responsive and directly address any issue areas and trends that all of our 700 plus grantee partners are in urgent need of. We offer custom support and tailored coaching where we dig deep into our networks of providers and match groups with the help that they need. We launched several new cohorts this year that are, we're really excited about to support 
including a healing justice theme cohort to build organization sustainability and ability to be in it for the long haul. This method was based on all of our huge successes from our first full year of serving groups in 2020, incorporating what our groups were asking us to do and the ways they need to be set up for success in their work. Here are just a few of the capacity building team's greatest hits from 2020. We moved $4.8 million in grants and support. This looked like getting over 250 tech tools to groups so that they could call members of their communities and tell them that those ballots that they got in the mail were real and that they can vote with them. We connected over 200 coaches to groups so that they could do things like in a greater volunteer engagement program into their campaign. That way they could expand their reach and mobilize volunteers to ensure that voters had the most up-to-date election information. We hosted nearly 30 trainings on a wide assortment of topics, including how to run a vote by mail campaign, which as you know, was new for many folks in 2020. 2020 was a huge win and the beginning of the wave of victories for us and our communities. In order to keep up the momentum and continue to hold lawmakers accountable, we need to find and cultivate the supporters and voters we need now so that we can mobilize them next year to have a full blue ticket, or as Zoe said, you know, for the rest of the decade, I, I can do the cheer, <laughs> but I won't do it as well. This means investing in 2021 as the capacity building year our grantee partners and movements are asking for. We need to make sure that our groups have the support, the access, the training, and the coaching that they need. This will allow them to find supporters and voters who they can commit to voting in 2022 and can re-engage in their work as movement leaders. These are the leaders who can activate their networks so that we have more value-driven voters at the polls. To do that, we need to start now with leveraging more resources, more coaches, more tools, and more support to help enter 2022 fully prepared to organize and mobilize at maximum speed. But don't take it just from me. No one knows what it takes to do this kind of year-round organizing better than our groups on the ground. I'm thrilled to have one of these groups with us today, a group that has been using some of our capacity building tools to fight back horrible anti-transgender legislation and building power now for next year. Please welcome Michael Soto from Equality Arizona. Thank you so much, JP. Uh, and I love your shirt looking really sharp I know. today. I know, twins. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We didn't plan that. <laughs> I'm Michael Soto. I'm the executive director of Equality Arizona, the statewide organization dedicated to building the political power of LGBTQ Arizonans. EQAZ has worked in Arizona since 1992, and we've been working with voters since 1992, but we've only been a part of the MVP ecosystem, especially the capacity building program, since the beginning of 2000. Before MVP, our biggest challenge was reaching enough voters to have a big enough long-term impact on the Arizona electoral and policy narrative. In 2018, we reached just over 100,000 voters, all in person, without tools, and that took an enormous amount of time and energy. In 2020, because of MVP support, especially the capacity building program, we reached over 2 million Arizonans during a pandemic about the 2020 election. The capacity building program gave us the tools we needed to be highly effective at voter engagement. In 2020 and today, we use Hustle to Text Bank, Empower to Organize, and we've benefited from invaluable training like Rapid Response Communications and Security School. While these tools are important, the coaching and the support were what actually prepared us to use the tools. When we first started in the capacity building program, we sat down with Eugenio and he walked, they walked us through the math of the organizing process and the first steps to develop a real plan to organize Arizona voters. Having clear and strategic objectives for voters in 2020 was a game changer. In 2021, we've continued to use the knowledge, tools, and resources we gained to defeat 32 dehumanizing bills on a wide range of issues from attacks on trans kids to voter suppression. We also won LGBTQ inclusive non-discrimination ordinances in three cities this spring. The success of this work wasn't just beating bad policy and winning good. The real win is that we activated the voters we first contacted in 2020 and turned them into grassroots act activists. With these activists, we convinced our governor to veto a dangerous bill that targeted LGBTQ youth 
and defeated a referendum on the Mesa non-discrimination ordinance. Equality Arizona knows the value of the capacity building program, and I'm so grateful for MVP support. Our hope for the future is simple. With the ongoing support of MVP, we can win the governor's seat and flip our legislature in 2022. These wins will change what's possible for Arizonans for decades to come. I'm a trans man of color living in Arizona. The work we're doing with MVP support is transforming Arizona into a state where I can live and thrive, where all LGBTQ people can have a future. I know y'all were a critical part of MVP's success and the capacity building program and everything that both achieved in 2020. And that means that you are also a part of Equality Arizona's success in 2020 and today. I really hope that you'll continue to get involved with MVP to support the capacity building program um, and to take advantage of these opportunities to get invested early in this work for 2022 because it's truly transformative. Thank you for all you've done for us at Equality Arizona and thank you for continuing to be a part of the MVP team. Oh my God, Michael. Yeah, I think you're making all of us cry. Like, like now I want to donate. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, JPP. And um, and I'm gonna pass it to one of our incredible donor organizers who's, you know, really at the heart of this work. Um, you know, the, the heart of the work is you know, groups like Equality Arizona and all the groups that, that Renee and Reggie work with who are doing the organizing. And then it's our job to organize ourselves to support them. So I'm gonna pass it to, to Jane, who's just an incredible organizer and artist and writer and many other things um, to bring us home. Thank you so much, Billy. And hi, everybody. Um, wow. So my name is Jane Lerner. I'm a donor advisor based in Brooklyn, calling you from New York City. And, you know, what we just heard, like, that's why we're here, right? Um, we're here to support the movement. Um, we're here for your support of the movement and for your support of organizations and of organizers, um, like the folks you met tonight, like Renee and Michael and Reggie. Um, we are here to support the vital work that they are doing to, trans to transform their communities. And personally, my life has been transformed by this work. Um, and by getting to be in community with all of you and with everybody on this, excuse me, on this call. And I'm just so happy to be here on this call, obviously a little nervous, um, and to see all of the new folks who are here. Hi to everybody on Facebook Live and on the live streams. Um, and also to all of our old friends, our longtime loves, um, you know, people who've been with us since the very beginning. And for those who know us, you know how much we love early investment. Um, and all of you on this call today, you are the early birds. You are the smart ones who are engaging now. And we couldn't be more grateful for your engagement, especially at this point in time, you have the foresight to be here now because you know that most of your folks are gonna wake up in like June or July of next year and call you and say, who should I fund? What should I do? Help, I'm so overwhelmed. But you, that's not you. You're here, you did this, you got it. <laughs> And granted, we all needed a break after that election cycle, but everybody here knows that we need to start as soon as possible. Um, because, you know, another thing we learned in our horrible pandemic year is that time is very tricky and very weird, and that November 22 is coming up really, really, really quick. Um, and what got me through such a strange and terrible year was this amazing donor team that I get to work with, everybody at MVP, and all of the donors that I got to work with over the past couple of years. Um, everyone has been so extraordinary. It's been so fun to get to work with so many donors and to see the completely inspirational and creative ways that donors have engaged with MVP, with their networks to talk about the work in such an incredible way. You've all thrown down so much. You've been generous beyond. You've reached out to your friends and your family. You've hosted house parties. You've liked our Instagram posts. You've joined all these briefings. But, you know, really, we're just getting started. 
Um, but we're so excited to bring you, bring more of you into these conversations, to deepen the conversations that we're already having with so many of you, and inspire each of you to go and talk with your networks, with your folks, and further those conversations to further the importance of funding the movement. Um, and we are so excited to invite you all to get even more involved in MVP in this cycle and next year. Um, we're developing our donor organizing plans. Maybe it's a possibility we can have an in-person party at some point, I hope. Um, but for now, we do encourage you to sign up for our grassroots donor organizing program. And um, that gives you a fancy individualized fundraising link that's all your own that you can track. And I think Tom, my colleague is putting that link excuse me, in the chat. Um, so you can be in touch with us if you have any questions about that. And, um, you know, we have this huge, huge goal and we're asking each and every one of you to be a part of reaching that goal. We've set this goal of $30 million in 2021. And we're asking each of you to help us reach that landmark and to get back to that early investment part. Um, you know, our advice really is to think about the entirety of the 22 cycle and front load that as much as you can because the organizers that you heard from tonight and the ecosystem of organizers across the country, they need that support as soon as possible to be fully loaded and ready to go for next year. Um, and maybe you'd like to become a sustainer and make a monthly donation, or maybe you could consider making a multi-year commitment to this work. I mean, those are the kinds of supports that just resonates with us so deeply on so many levels. Um, so no matter how you join in, we're so grateful for your time and for your connection to MVP, for your commitment to this work year in and year out. And we are ready to win together with you. Um, so thank you so much for, for being here, for coming along with us and um, stay cool and see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane, and thank you everyone who joined this call, all the incredible partners, organizers. We're doing this together and together we're gonna to build a progressive decade. And I'm gonna end with this with a chant. And this is actually the earliest we've ever ended an MVP call, like almost right after the hour. So huge, huge appreciation to everyone. Let's build this movement together. When I say progressive, you say decade, progressive, decade, progressive, decade. When I say progressive, you say decade, 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 progressive, decade. All right, let's end strong and send all the love and energy and support to these organizations. And let's organize everyone we know to send everything we have to support them because they are going to save us and our children's and grandchildren's future. So much gratitude. Thank you all. Go team.